Hey there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 545. This is 545 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you're doing good. I hope you're doing kushti as per usual. How am I feeling amazing? Feeling amazing, I'm not going to lie. These last few weeks have been pretty decent especially in terms of abstaining from things and just working out and reading a bunch and watching movies and engrossing myself in culture. I've got a little couple of private viewers I'm going to go to on Thursday. No, yeah, on Thursday, like I'm living a rich, rich, rich life. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie to you. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. And um, this is what I usually do at the beginning of each year anyway. And I usually then kind of tail off and get lazy. But I think if I can commit to stick into some sort of regimen or some sort of structured way of living between Monday and Friday, I'll be far better for it. I think this also goes to speak upon, I think this also extends to how I have been approaching fashion and stuff I've been wearing. Again, this is a little bit surface level. It might seem a little bit trite and a little bit um, reductive and a little bit simplistic and whatever it may be, whatever all those words are, right? I just pull them out of the urethra. That's another word too. But um, I found for myself anyway, personally, right? I found, right, that the times that I'm usually the most productive are also the times that I kind of have a very set way of living day to day. So Monday to Friday or Monday to Sunday, I have a very kind of particular way I live. And it also seems to coincide with the clothes I wear. And if I have like a, for instance, like I have like a particular outfit I kind of pull from if I need to go out somewhere or if I've got a particular outfit, if I go to need to go to this sort of occasion, usually I split them between three. I usually have like a an outfit that I can, I can wear around town when I'm kind of going to do my errands, an outfit I can wear if I'm going to go maybe shopping and an outfit I can wear if I want to go out. Right. That's usually the kind of thing that I kind of look at, or maybe an outfit to go and do cultural events and maybe an outfit to go out sort of thing. Right. And it's usually a set sort of outfit to wear. And I found for myself anyway, that when I have that sort of done and I've got my little regimen or I've got my little structure of things I like to wear, life gets a little bit easier. I don't tend to worry about external things that don't really matter too tough. And I seem to be a little bit more productive. So I think if I can approach this way or if I can adopt this throughout the entirety of the year, which is something as well, it's not new to me. This is something I've done many many times over the years but you know like fad diets i come i kind of wane in and out of them here and there but it's something that i kind of stuck to religiously especially when i was really partying and really going for it and really trying to make my name for myself out there on that london scene i kind of told myself i need to have some level of structure in order for me to make those outdoor gallivanting occasions worthwhile because the last thing you want to do is give is kind of create this false narrative for yourself or this idea that you're going out to kind of network and you're spending most of your time getting on it or losing stuff and just being a mess you want to at least give your trick yourself that you're doing something productive and the way to trick yourself is to obviously be somewhat sober between the, the days of monday and friday or to have some sort of um relaxed chilled way of living Monday to Friday maybe focus more on work and then go and sort of celebrate quote unquote the end of the week on the weekend what I've usually found also is that once you have that kind of balance similar to when you're doing a diet and they say you've got a cheat day I think I mentioned this in another podcast sometimes when you've got a cheat day in the diet it can sometimes feel as if like especially when you first start you just want to pig out completely when you go on that first day no, yeah, yeah, you want to pick out completely on that cheat day. Like, oh my God, I can't wait to do this, that, and that, and go here, here, here. But then, as you get into the diet, you start to kind of it starts to become a bit of way. Of, it starts to become a way of life. You start to realize that those pig out days aren't really worth it. They make you feel sick because obviously abstaining from those sort of processed foods or whatever your vices for a long period of time it can maybe it can maybe kind of cause you to have a bit more sensitivity to the things that you maybe took for granted or yet all the time. Similarly, like to, you know, if you quit soda or like, you know, fizzy drinks and you start drinking them again, you can really taste the sugar because obviously you've been out with sugar, you've been, out, you've been without it for so long. So usually what happens is that once you start, you know, adopting this new way of life in terms of how you're eating, what you're drinking, when you're sleeping, blah, 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 blah. The, the cheat days start to, the, the kind of importance of a cheat day start to diminish somewhat. And I found myself also, if you, try and keep yourself somewhat sensible between Monday and Friday the whole like going out on the weekend that that importance starts to wane also or maybe going out and actually going crazy starts to wane you're not trying to turn every single weekend into um what's that thing called um 
you know, the the last part of your nerve. That's not what it needs to be. It just ends up being a night for you to kind of shake a leg, maybe have a have a cheeky flirt, have a little get a little bit tipsy and then you go home. So you start to have a little bit more of a balanced, normal relationship with going out. And I feel like I've over the last few months I've changed in that regard. I think I've matured a little bit in the way that I approach things and also because I clearly want to have some sort of career in that field for the long term and if I do want to have a career in that field in the long term whether it's owning my own club whether it's being a DJ myself I need to be able to um, navigate that scene without it always turning into a sesh which it hasn't in the last few months so that's been perfect I think the biggest sort of wake up call to that was definitely Berlin when I went recently in February I was able to enjoy it it's probably my most enjoyable Berlin trip I've ever had in the last few years I legitimately went and I came back and I remembered everything because <laughs> usually when I go and I come back I don't have any idea where I went I used to have to go through my phone and check my pictures or whatever to check or maybe my Instagram stories or something I have no idea what happened this time I had I remembered to complete everything I went and saw some friends I hung out in bars went to some um, you know some cool shops did a, did a little bit of sightseeing which I never do at some cool restaurants and then obviously experienced like the beauty of Bergheim but I got to experience that as well as like a somewhat sensible adult and got to sort of stay there for way more hours than I usually have done because I was able to kind of you know um, pace myself a little better and not just go full pelt right at the beginning which is what I did in the past and you know for terms of longevity in terms of like having this being part of my life in terms of a hobby or in terms of an interest that I like to do going out to clubs and stuff you just can't do it all the time it is uh, it's an unfortunate f thing because I would like I would who wouldn't like to be able to get on it every single time you go out but I think if you really do enjoy going out and you really do exploring these new clubs and maybe visiting new places and hearing new people play and being around people and stuff you just that should be enough for you that should be enough of a high that you don't need to do all the other stuff doesn't mean you have to quit it completely I don't also agree with that i think this whole idea around sober raving is a little bit trite it's a little bit whatever i think for the most part there needs to be a more healthier relationship people need to have with how they go out and how they basically treat themselves treat their body their friends how they basically navigate the spaces around them how they treat people respects near them like there's all these little things that need to be addressed more so than the idea of sober raving that's literally the worst i think initiative to baby drive home that's not really the message obviously if you have an issue that might be something you should address but i think having a better more sort of um what, what do you call it some sort of a sensible relationship with going out might be the best way to do things so um that's been fairly good i'm not going to lie that's been really really good and i'm actually looking forward to now this um trip that i'm meant to be taking to ukraine <laughs> to go to kiev and this is it's funny right because i mentioned ukraine the other day on the podcast about how oh I'm tempted to go. I'm really want, I'm tempted. I really want to go. I've already got a month planned out that I want to go and visit. I've already specced out a couple of Airbnbs. I've made a wish list um, of ones I want to stay at. I've also got a Google Maps going with locations I want to visit and restaurants and all this sort of stuff and um, monuments and blah, 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 blah. And I guess I was so head in the clouds i completely missed the political situation that's going on there in ukraine because i guess once i was when i was searching for stuff regarding kiev i was just searching in terms of kiev nightclubs kiev restaurants kiev whatever art galleries kiev vintage stores i wasn't searching just the keyword ukraine because these days on google the great thing about it if you just search a country imagine you want to go to like lanzarote you want to go to costa rica or whatever you just write in google and it will usually give you the first few links obviously if there's nothing going on it'll just be stuff concerning the country you want to go to but usually if there's something happened within the last month or so in the, in the country you want to visit they'll usually give you a little heads up like there'll be some news articles there oh this happened here this happened there so at least you have an idea what's going on you're not just walking in blind and i guess once i typed in just the word ukraine and didn't write the kiev instantly articles such as the following popped up on my feed russia ukraine what's happening on the border and why are tensions so high and you've got this picture on sky news of a soldier um, a russian troop stationed on the border with ukraine with his gun out and a tank behind him you're like okay cool so this is the following the us and uk have warned by russia that it would pay a heavy price if it invades ukraine tensions between the russia and the west are at the worst they have been since the cold war with uk foreign secretary liz Truss claiming that an invasion would only lead to a terrible quagmire and loss of life so a slight warning from good old liz Truss. it continues or Liz truce um currently more than currently more than rush sorry currently more than russian what currently 
more than 100,000 Russian troops are stationed there, if wrong, uh, at various points along the border with Ukraine, a former Soviet state. Uh, President Vladimir Putin and his officials insist that they're just carrying out military exercises. But fears of an invasion have been mounting since last year when satellite imagery showed um, Russia sending more equipment and personnel. You know, this reminds me of this idea that, oh, no, we're just we're just doing some training exercises. We're just getting our soldiers through some burpees in full gear just to see if they're up to it. This kind of reminds me of that episode of Family Guy where Brian is like all jacked up. No, or Stewie's all jacked up in it. And he's like, you know, he's like stopping Brian at the door. Hey, hey, hey. Every time Brian tries to pass, he does that. And then he's like, oh, and he gets scared. He's like, I'm only joking with you. And he does it again all the time. That kind of like um, bully, that kind of a, uh, that kind of bully boy tactic thing where you're trying to pretend like you're not doing anything, but you are doing something by just your mere presence. Um, so it's a story briefly. It says here, Ukraine was part of the USSR, the Russian Empire for centuries before it became part of the USSR. When the Soviet Union dissolved in the end of Cold War in 1991, Ukraine became independent. Uh, although their shared history means the two are still very culturally linked, Ukraine has sought to distance itself from Russia in recent years and instead looked to the West for support, which probably explains why everyone's basically going there. Because I would have imagined if you do, just looking from your head, you would have thought, hmm, Russia's, Russia and Ukraine are quite linked. You wouldn't necessarily think Russia has the greatest clubbing scene ever but it actually does a lot of people say going out to St. Petersburg and stuff is actually a good time but then I guess because Russia Ukraine have definitely made a stand to say hey we're completely different from Russia we have a very progressive sort of um, um, western way of looking at the world and our culture and whatnot people have maybe felt a bit more comfortable about going there because you know why else would you go to a country like that but then also there was that report a few months ago about that far-right Nazi group you know going and basically bombarding some bar i think it's like hlvl or something like that um that obviously sounds a bit sketchy and i would imagine those same people wouldn't be too happy if they saw my mug would they <laughs> they wouldn't be too happy but we hope and pray it continues here it says by contrast ukraine has a huge loss sorry it was a huge loss for russia as it had the biggest population of all former soviet states to break away from moscow and with Vladimir putin's rise to power the kremlin has sought to regain influence and control over its former territories it's funny though right um, Russia feels as if Ukraine is becoming too westernized so they want to regain control by installing a puppet government in order to do what? Do you know what I mean? You feel like they are getting influenced by the foreign powers but then you want to go in and what? Rectify it. So they're acting as if they're doing what the America do, right? Acting as the world's police but they're acting as Soviet police. <laughs> Mad. Um, this began with more subtle approach in the early 2000s, but when its favored candidate in 20, 2004 Ukrainian election, Viktor y y Yokankov, was ousted by for rigging the results amid Orange Revolution, protests in Kiev, things began to change. Furious with the election of pro Western opposition candidate Viktor Yushchenko, the Mr. Putin's approach became more aggressive. It culminated in Russia's illegal ex annexation of the Ukraine peninsula of Crimea in 2014. I remember that. Uh, Mr. M. Yushchenko managed to gain regain power sorry to gain power after five years of mr yushchenko in 2010 and served for four years but when the kremlin backed president rejected the association agreement with the eu in favor to bolster relations with moscow there was a huge protest and he was ousted so ukrainian people don't ramp in it Russia's response was to annex Crimea and declare it independent from Ukraine. It also sent troops in the Ukrainian region of Donetsk and Luhansk, an area known as Donbass, to support the separatists who have been trying to break away from the country. Fighting in Donbass, which is near the Russian border, has resulted in the death of more than 14,000 people since 2014. God almighty. I had no idea. France and Germany are spearheaded a peace agreement between the two sides in 2015, which helped end major conflicts, but it failed to unite the two sides politically and small scale tensions have continued since then. In early 2002 and in early 2021, there had been an increasing incidences of breaking the 2015 ceasefire, which fueled fears of a war. But in April, Moscow pulled back most of its troops and tensions lessened. So yeah, it's a it's a hot pot situation. Loads of things are going on there, and I just want to go and rave. Really, this is why we need um, Lex Friedman to get on the blower and have Vladimir Putin sit down his podcast and kind of hash things out again. If Lex Friedman can lead with love, this I think is this interview with this Lex wants with Vladimir Putin is going to be a car crash, isn't it? My man wants to. It's it's like how can you interview Vladimir Putin without mentioning the fact that he allegedly might have got some of his political opponents flipping offed 
and that you know he's trying to basically take back control of a country that has, has kind of pulled away and gained independence because he feels that like they're becoming too western like what legal right do they have to do that and he has to sit there and pretend what well, he has to ask him question about judo <laughs> <laughs> so what about what time he wakes up what his favorite books are it's like come on man although i would like to see an interview with vladimir putin and lex friedman simply so we could just hear vladimir putin speak english for an entire interview because he clearly can speak english but he prefers not to he prefers to just do that what what a lot of foreign people do where they they would much rather pretend like they don't understand your language or, pret or act dumb in the hope that you will basically take them you basically what's that word called you take them for I'm not saying for granted, but you basically won't take them seriously so that they can then show you how really smart they are by ups by kind of you know one upping you later on down the line. It's a very clever tactic. Like if you, especially if you don't want to um, give anybody an inch in negotiation tactics and skills, you know what I mean? Taking away the language factor, it immediately makes the other person feel as if they're smarter. Do you know what I mean? When they actually aren't because it's just language. What makes you think because you speak one language and I speak another that you're any smarter than I am? That makes no sense but i would like to hear what his english speaking voice is like and how what his humor is like and his perspective on that regard that would be interesting but lex Friedman is going to go in there and just jack him off and start speaking about love uniting healing the world asking him a question about the flipping facebook metaverse like what you've got you've got you've got flipping vladimir putin sitting next to you i mean one of the most uh interesting and fearsome leaders out there who's legitimately you know got blood on his hands and you're gonna sit there asking him about flipping facebook and whether or not he likes instagram come on man i want to find out where his daughters are like we don't get pictures like he's fascinating man do you remember that do you remember that um there's a mansion that he supposedly built let me see if i can get it um let's just see it was like a mansion that he built right that was vlad let me see if i can get it here vladimir putin mansion some mansion that he built that looked amazing it was like in the side of a mountain supposedly it's it's a new thing that it was built right not too sure if it's built yeah this is the one see look at this shit supposedly he bought this like it looks like some flipping thing out of a super villain movie right or of a superhero movie putin's house in whatever that word is skull designed by visualization let me check out see if this is actually real i remember seeing this on a feed one time look at that it's in like the built in the middle of the forest it looks like a looks like something from the 1970s something like that like the jetsons it's essentially on the plinth raised up in a platform and it's got the house all on one floor amazing um the russian architect and designer roman vlasko of roman las lasov or is that his name las lasov or do you say vlasov i guess it's lasov has envisioned putin's house a fantastic conceptual house design nestled uh, among the forests in sochi the largest resort in russia or a story about also oh, it's, it's a concept it's not an actual real home oh man i got duped again once again but it looks amazing though doesn't it look at that but that's what I would want to ask him about. Like, you know, what's the deal with this? How do you get up there? <laughs> why did you why did you design this? <laughs> what sort of evil plans have you got in, in case for it? It's absolutely amazing, honestly. It looks so cool. But yeah, whatever. What well, let's see what happens. Um obviously the Ukraine trip is still on on pause now for the moment. Need to find out what's gonna go on over there in Ukraine. Hopefully things are not too crazy. And if they aren't, of course I'm still gonna go. So I'm really looking forward to it. And again, any recommendations for people that have been there, let me know in the comments down below. I'll put the um link to my contact thing on my podcast page for you obviously to contact me and let me know too. That'd be greatly appreciated. Any heads up, I would really appreciate that. The other thing I've been doing also was finishing Ozark season four. Now bear with me when it comes to series and stuff especially when it comes to netflix stuff i tend to skim through a lot of it so i maybe watch the first three episodes of four in full and then the rest of them because i kind of got the gist of the story i'd, I'd kind of skip through some dialogue bits i'm not too bothered about with some you know um uh auxiliary you know whatever characters i don't really care too much for but i have to be honest right this season for me wasn't the strongest of course that always happens because season one and two were so good but it also was incredibly infuriating as a show to watch. Incredibly infuriating. And mostly because of Wendy fucking Bird. Why has she not died? I do not understand that. And also, why have none of the Bird family, direct Bird family, suffered any consequences for their actions? None of their kids have died. None of them have died. It's just been 
plain sailing for the both of them for the most part yes other people next to them have died wendy's dad uh, sorry wendy's um brother has died and whatever it may be and obviously the old guy that used to live next door um unfortunately passed away too but none of them directly has passed away none of them has lost a finger you know maybe paralyzed whatever nothing happened happened they get they seem to be immune from consequences yet everybody else seems to have to suffer the abuse and the turmoil has to go through constant misery and just as they feel as if they like they're kind of pulling themselves out from the pit again bang they get slammed to the ground again this series has been infuriating i know people on social have been talking about jonah and how they hate the sun but i get it the son i get i get his reaction i get why he's being like this he's a teenage boy suddenly coming to a realization that his parents that he held up on a pedestal aren't necessarily the people that he thought they are especially when he finds out that they had harmed people in his family because he probably had that naive thinking where he thought you know like how um rory and Moore from the joe budden podcast even though joe budden fucked over so many other pe so many people along the way and did wrong by so many people or maybe they you know had bad experiences with him they never ever thought in their heads that that could happen to them they thought no joe would never do that to us because we're friends because we're boys because we're friends because he got our back but it's like nah if you can do it to other people you can also do it to you and i think what jonah's realizing is that all the stuff that his parents have done to others they now doing to people within the family or people that they supposedly love or people that they supposedly meant to be looking out for so in his own head or his own way he is also rebelling against them which i completely understand and let's be honest too wendy bird is a manipulative psychotic woman to the ex 10th extreme and it's a good character as well because from the beginning she was very hesitant about um, marty bird getting into this um line of business but then slowly as time has progressed and she's gotten used to the trappings of that life or whatever it may be or the power it gives or the sort of um adulation that it gives or the access she's slowly but surely become more convinced about this way of life more so than marty and doesn't see anything else other than it but the other thing that's probably a tragic thing about the series that's really good that they do really well to sort of depict is this weird naivety that they both have as a family that yeah they have as a couple and as heads of the family where they honestly think that all they have to do is one more job and they get out of it scot-free even though everybody that's been associated with this deal or that's lived within their kind of universe within this kind of drug dealing thing that's happening in the ozarks they've all kind of like had to pay the biggest price they somehow think that they're still going to drive away into the sunset and live a somewhat legitimate life after they've made whatever they've made for of this it just doesn't work like that clearly something tragic should happen will happen in the second part of season four because they split it into four two seasons sorry into two parts one parts yes 14 episodes uh split into seven seven parts two parts right whatever sorry it's been seven episodes two parts my brain is fried but you get what i mean but yeah the when the, the lack of consequences director Wendy Bird get pissed me off. She's the most annoying character on there. She has done so many things that would deserve her to get beaten up or to get pushed or to get run over or something. Whereas Marty Bird had to get gun bucked by the psychotic new crazy um lieutenant for the Mexican cartel, um who I also think hasn't done too he hasn't been unhinged enough for me. He came in a little bit unhinged, but he hasn't done more I know already people are like, Oh yeah, he killed um what's his name? Um he killed uh, Ruth's uh, nephew and Darlene, but he hasn't done, he should have done more. I don't know why. He came in crazy and psychotic, but he kind of mellowed out too much for me. Of course, by the end, he caused kills Darlene and the nephew, who, you know, for that side of thing was really tragic that they both had to die like that with the baby wailing in the background. That was really sad considering that they were trying to get out of it by that time it was too late and i think their card had already been marked um because you know that that crazy uh other lieutenant of the not of the mexican cartel basically didn't take a liking to them but jesus man why don't these guys get any direct consequences why are either of them still alive it doesn't make any sense especially if it's the last season i understand if it's going to continue but this is meant to be the last season and i don't know why either of them are still aren't dead or their kids aren't dead it just doesn't make any sense they'll probably end up killing ruth before they kill you know marty or wendy and it doesn't make any sense because if this is real life again it's not real life it's a tv series i know but if it's a depiction of how a normal everyday couple with two kids and a dog can go from being you know model citizens to descending into the pits of organized crime and drug dealing and whatnot someone has to pay a price you don't just get out of it scot-free there was a story that went viral a few months ago 
I think during the beginning of the pandemic, this lady somewhere in the UK, I'm going to say Kent or something like this, really stand-up woman, normal lady, had somehow got herself involved in smuggling bricks of cocaine into the UK. I guess because the port was next to where she lived or she has some contacts. I don't know what happened. But essentially, she was making millions, millions a day, millions a week, like crazy amounts of money. And she was pretty smart about not spending too much, about living very modestly. Um, and she was just basically living a life and somehow she ended up getting caught. But she got caught and I think her and her boyfriend at the time or partner got double digit numbers in prison. But that's how it ends. You don't just deal that sort. You don't you don't deal the, uh, for instance, for, from what I'm sure of, if I remember correctly, the numbers that she was dealing with in terms of millions, I guess, I think something like 30 million she'd made off the back of those deals, right? Because I guess she was the person that maybe signed the final releases for the bricks to go through and somehow she got caught. You know, mistakes happen or you just get caught. It is what it is. But she did get caught and, you know, she spent time in prison because she was dealing in crazy high amounts that are always going to attract attention you can't if you want to make a couple of grand you want to buy a car you want to go on a holiday i'm sure you could probably get away with it because police aren't gonna worry about you too tough but once you start actually moving tons of coke into a country or you start smuggling this smuggling that or offing people here or getting rid of your rivals there so you're going to attract the attention of law enforcement or you're going to attract the attention of people that you don't want to attract attention of and you'll pay the ultimate price and that's why i think sometimes you know western series that's the thing they don't get right compared to european series like gomorrah and whatnot right they are really good or even Engrenage, just really incredible french series and um, i think in english it's called spiral it does really well in this kind of depiction of the under the criminal underworld it kind of presents people as human it's not just good or bad or black and white it's kind of a bit complex in terms of how they got in that position and why they're there what their motivations are blah 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 and it also doesn't it also does the same thing for the police it doesn't paint them out to be that the saviors and the angels that come in to kind of rectify society no they're also flawed in their own way but what it always proves and what it always displays is that that life of crime generally you don't get hope you don't get to ride off in the sunset generally you pay the ultimate price whether it's losing a family member somebody close to you losing all your money or spending all your time in jail or ultimately dying that's what ultimately happens you don't just right away into the sunset and i feel like in this one they put they're kind of gearing us up to witness the bird family be one of the only families that happens to ride out into the sunset and i just don't think that's it just it just it, it would make me too angry it would infuriate me too angry to suffer through what i had to suffer through or what we had to suffer through watching this series and then having to see people like ruth is a great character in this you know the bit where she screams um at the last episode um at marty about if they want to stop her they have to kill her because they've killed her nephew the one person that she loved for real oh man that was so good what a great actress that lady is man that like, really really good such a powerful and visceral scene and just a little things like this like the scene on the boat you know what i mean just the the quiet sort of um shock and scare of it this is obviously one of the best seasons on the end of season three you know when he kills helen uh yeah but honestly check it out Ozarks for me still really annoying that the wrong people keep dying first before the people that deserve to die should die but in terms of a series it was fairly entertaining and I'm glad I watched it can't wait for part two next on the list we need to talk about this crazy nonsense do you remember I told you earlier on in the podcast uh, maybe in the beginning of the pandemic I think I mentioned it and a few Joe Rogan fans were in my comments going crazy oh you don't know what you're talking about and, you know anti-vax people going nuts but essentially I don't care that whole debate about anti-vax lockdown I don't give a crap leave me alone right it's a nonsense debate it's boring it's r-worded go away but there's no denying that covid and everything surrounding it from the lockdowns um, to the restrictions of travel or whatever it may be has legitimately broken some people's brains to the point where I don't think they can ever be fixed I think if you're somebody who legitimately is out here dancing and making TikToks for people to get vaccinated and stuff you're never not going to be that psycho if you're a person who's dancing and singing songs about you know Fauci getting in a car crash or you know how you don't going to get vaccinated you know that you're never going to get saved either so both people on either side of the debate are broken eternally the people that you know dance along to flipping um those weird tv show songs about the vaccine and stuff people that you know talk about the covid as if it doesn't exist and it's just a flu you are all broken broken to the fullest extent and i and i you know and i feel sad for you because essentially there's nothing you can do in terms of fixing people especially if they're grown-up adults if they're grown-ass adults is like 
what can you tell them and this is a good example of this is a courtesy of the new york post it says folk singer hannah hawker dies of covid after deliberately catching the virus so a folk singer from the czech republic right has been infested with the same COVID hysteria that's been infecting loads of people, loads of Karen that we've seen in the US, we've seen videos here in the UK. It's just so sad to see, really sad to see. This woman caught COVID deliberately to prove a point and then it ends up passing away because it's a virus and it is lethal if you are somebody that has pre-existing health conditions or you're just unlucky. Why would you go out of your way to catch a virus just to prove a point? Who are you proving the point to? It's just psycho behavior and it's really sad because somebody has legitimately lost their mom at an age that they shouldn't have lost her at somebody you know i'd imagine she was a very popular folk singer out there in czech republic maybe that genre of music is really popular out there traditional folk music with a little modern spin she's probably got loads of fans she probably sells out places that she goes and performs at and now they want to be able to see her because she got infected with the covid hysteria it's a nonsense absolute nonsense so this is an article courtesy of new york post it says veteran folk singer hannah hawker died on sunday of covid19 after intentionally exposing herself to the virus in an ill-advised self-immunization attempt she was 57 years old now don't get me wrong it's a new york post essentially from what i've read it's basically the u.s version of the daily mail so let's take this story the of salt but i think the premise is somewhat correct it says a czech musician's passing was confirmed by her son jan rick who told prague morning that she preferred to catch the disease than get vaccinated her fatal goal to regain access to her favorite off-limit sources of entertainment <sighs> Per her son's account, Hawker, lead vocalist of the popular international band um, Assonance, had wanted a recovery pass to the sauna and theatre in her native Republic, Czech Republic, where either proof of vaccination or recent infection is required to access specific cultural venues. So she basically tried to do the same thing that Novak Djokovic tried to do, right? Where he basically, even though he's caught COVID twice before, he tried to lie and say he had it again so that he could get um, exemption in order to go through and play the Australian Open like proper prick behavior like again as i keep saying like people will add my comments about that too that guy is a prick let's just call a spade a spade like going out here like both people are pricks right both sides of the conversation the people that are gonna go out there and see you in a restaurant and force you to wear a mask in between you taking two taking bites of your flipping tiramisu they're cunts you going into a restaurant and forcing them or getting into an argument because they won't let you in because you're not wearing a mask you're also being a prick like let's just grow up and be adults about it yes i know it's annoying but prepare your past prepare your mask just have it in your back pocket put it on when you need to put it on if you don't need to put it on take it off it's no big deal but all this sort of like i don't know all these games people are playing it just feels so inf like it's not even infantile it feels so like it just feels ridiculous it really does feel ridiculous it's worse than infantile it's just ridiculous it continues it says uh the, the, the hawker who hadn't gotten the shot saw an opportunity for the latter after both wreck and her father caught the virus over the christmas despite being vaccinated instead of self-isolating she deliberately hung around the infected family members so i guess she was basically saying hey you guys are vaccinated again this is unvaccinated people logic you guys are unvaccinated and you still got the virus that proves that the vaccine doesn't work and it's like who told you the vaccine was a flipping cure and defense and basically a way for you not to get a virus at all no one's saying that it's just a way for you to prevent your yourself from actually passing away from it if you do get it it limits the the kind of um, severity of the virus Less, it's not a, all it's not a one-stop shop cure all but i guess the messaging has been muddled up or some people just have that kind of thinking and they just don't kind of move from it i don't know but look she's a fairly young lady 57 is no year age to die especially nowadays especially for somebody that's a folk singer she, i guess she was probably well off um living in czech republic i guess the way of the the the, the the cost of life there isn't the most expensive compared to other places in the in in Europe, and look, fifty seven years old. That's no age to die. None. Um, it continues here, like you know, she seemed like a very chirpy, outgoing type of person. Clearly, an eccentric, clearly an artistic person. Clearly, somebody with a lot of creative vigor. Look, young in life. You know I mean, you wouldn't guess she was fifty seven. She looks very healthy and ready to go. Maybe despite you know, just a regular a regular mum doing regular mum shit she says she should have isolated for a week because she tested positive but she was with us the whole time lamented wreck who referred to his mother as quite a legend in country and folk music circles the vocalist revealed a covid catching scheme on social media claiming she was recovering well from the disease 
Uh, you know what's bad as well because if she if she would have been okay and she wouldn't have died, she still would have sent the wrong message, and somebody else from her fan base would have taken that message and tried to do the same thing. So it's doubly wrong. Somebody in that position shouldn't be sharing those kind of messages in a way to what um, dare your fan base to follow you in that regard. That shouldn't be how what you're doing. It's why it's why I don't get the the, the beef with Joe Rogan. I understand it's annoying what he's saying about Ivor Vecton, but it's not like he's coming out and saying that you should get this. He's just a rich guy, shit, isn't it? If he's got an option where he doesn't need to take the vaccine and he's got all these witch, shot, witch doctors, as Tim Dylan referred to them as, that can help him out in terms of preventing him from catching it or helping him to recover quickly when he does get it, then fair play, let him rock. It's just another option. It's just another solution. If you have the funds or if you have the access to do so, you can. But this idea that you should follow these people is not good, but also things like this are just not productive. They're not constructive. They're not helpful. <sighs> Um, she says that um, I survived it was intense said Hawk I wrote in a post according to a local news outlet so now there will be an, a, 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 there will be the theatre sauna and concert and an urgent trip to the sea life is here for me and for you too this lady man she sounds like she like covid really broke her brain what a tragic story two days later the folk singer reportedly died due to coronavirus complications with her son reporting that the, she choked to death within 10 minutes yo uh god almighty um Rick has since blamed the anti-vaxxer movement on a, for a loss noting that her mum frequently shared anti-vaccine articles on social media <laughs> uh, i know exactly who influenced her who reportedly tried to convince hawker to uh, immunize to no avail it makes me sad that she believed strangers more than her proper family or maybe the medical doctors or maybe your you know uh, whatever your cdc is over there in czech republic meanwhile the member uh, anyway look man in one way this is sad in another way she went out on the, on her convictions she went out on her sword she truly believed being unvaccinated wouldn't hurt and she'd be fine and the vaccine virus was basically overblown and if she got it she'll be completely okay and she was proven wrong unfortunately but she died on her word right she stood up for her convictions and she backed her talk more people don't do that and a lot of people just kind of speak from the sidelines in kind of whispered breath or don't say anything or just don't have a position anywhere and just kind of go wherever the wind blows at least she stood on her 10 toes and said na 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 you are not jabbing me up under no circumstances i'm healthy i'm fit i'm full of life i make music in my little studio at home i've got these great records that people love i perform sold out shows i wear these kooky artistic old lady dresses and gowns and shit people love me i've got an infectious smile right and she she rolled the dice and it didn't work out but at least she lived a life she lived a really fruitful life 57 years of creating amazing music and amazing moments for people stuff that is immortalized like kind of like you know what an architect they say an architect some people say like architectural buildings are like um you know uh, a form of an erection right or like a tombstone or some sort of memorial for that architect because once they've been and gone this building still stands there as an honor or as a monument to their greatness and to their glory right that's why architects they say are so full of themselves and maybe in some respects she's given so much to the world this must maybe her way to go out she's got all these albums all these cds and dvds and youtube clips of her performing all over the place that people can play again and again and again so maybe she doesn't need to be here anymore she's already served her purpose as an artist in that regard who knows but there's no denying covid has broken people's brains to the point where i don't think it's ever going to go back to normal i mentioned before this on this podcast about oh i don't know when we're ever going to return back to normal like as in like when will life go back to how it was in 2019 when we had no idea about the virus and we were just living our lives being la di la di da or even 2018 a year before that and i was saying that maybe five years from now could be the time where we kind of feel like things have returned back to normal so that's what 2020 2028 or something 2027 roughly around then is when i think it'll go back to normal and maybe some people are you know hypothesizing that it will never will go back to that level of normality but that's one thing that i can envision that, that i can kind of envision happening i could got it in my head but in terms of this anti-vax person when would they stop existing or when would they stop harassing people and stop talking about mind control and 5g that's never happening like that person's gone 
it's over for them like their brain's broken it's fried the same way the person who was wiping down their flipping groceries and wearing four masks when they're going to when they're going out to flipping um morrison's and stuff that person also isn't going to change they're also gone so it's sad to see on both sides of the aisle but you know say la vie and all that say la vie talking about covid and whatnot there was a really interesting article or it's a really um interesting clip that went viral across my side of social media especially on twitter the other day featuring barry weiss on the what's his face show what's the guy's name it doesn't matter the white guy that's got a table that talks there's loads of those american shows that are in it white guy with a table that talks to the camera um barry weiss went on there and basically spoke quite um passionately about how she's done with covid and how she's done with the restrictions and double the lockdown she's got basically covid fatigue and some people received it well some people didn't receive it well but it's funny that people are saying this now on, on let's say mainstream tv channels and they're being met with claps and you know and a lot of encouragement because if she would have said this 6 12 18 months ago people would have you know wanted her murdered do you know what i mean and basically take away her social media accounts and she's cancelled da, 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 da. but nowadays people are a bit more receptive to this sort of talk so i'll play the clip of what she says here and then you guys and then i'll obviously give you my side of the other side of it as well yeah uh, there you go And of course, she made some great points. And I heard some people pushing back saying, what about the nurses? She's not talking about the nurses. They're working so hard. It's like, bruv, that's part of the job. I never understood why. Maybe in the beginning, it was something to maybe marvel at and be aghast at and kind of feel sorry for them when they used to post their pictures of, I've been in ER for seven hours. Here's a picture of my face with the marks of the mask all over their nose and whatnot when it's kind of, you know, pulling at their face and whatnot after a tour by a shift because they haven't taken it off but i don't know you that's part of the gig you sign up for the gig and it's like, it's like being a firefighter and complaining you have to go up a flight of stairs or you have to go up a ladder and something it's like that's part of the gig mate it might flip up your breathing it might mess you up long term you might be it might cause you to be impotent because of all the toxic fumes you're taking but you're so convinced you're so convinced this is your vocation this is what you're calling it this is what you've been put on the earth to do that you're following through and going to firefighting school doing whatever needs to be done in order to be a legitimate firefighter same thing goes to you know doctors nurses whatever it may be this is part of the job and unfortunately we're living in a time in this period where, you know nowadays where this pandemic happened and it completely derailed everybody's lives and everyone's careers and aspirations and family life and relationships cool but part of your job is to do what you're doing wearing a mask for 17 hours and helping people that don't want to be helped especially anti-vax people it's annoying i know but part of the gig so this whole defense about let's think of the nurses think of the doctors like yeah they're working they should be working not out there dancing doing tiktoks and shit like what and then that defense of that is oh they're having fun why can't they have fun all right cool but also if they can have fun we can poke fun at them 
we can laugh at the fact that these nurses that are complaining about pay and complaining about being overworked are also deciding to dance and make TikToks. It's funny. It is both funny and ridiculous. Everyone's ridiculous in this regard, but it's just interesting to see, especially in the US, this sort of um, speech is a lot more welcomed. It's not as right wingy as it was before. When you came out and said stuff like this, people thought you had flipping posters of Trump in your bedroom. You couldn't just be like, nah, I'm not Republican at all. I just think locking down people, especially in that kind of country where everybody's about freedom and liberté, right? It's just not going to work. <laughs> it really isn't. If you tell people what to do in America, it feels like the automatic thing that they say is like, fuck you. <laughs> That's automatic what they do. In the UK, we're, we're a bit more, we're more pussies in that regard. We seem to acquiesce a bit. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We don't want people to get upset with us. So we just, okay, cool. I'll just do it just so I don't, I don't kind of cause a scene. That's what we don't like is on the UK. We don't like a scene. We don't like extravagance. We don't like you know that's why probably people celebrities that sort of suffer this kind of um backlash from the media or backlash from just you know fans and viewers alike is because they're a bit too flashy they're a little bit too in your face whereas in america they celebrate that sort of flashiness that uh, you know extraness whereas here we're like mm, chill out so when someone told you to relax and stay at home you know like, okay i will i guess i will then wash your groceries okay i will no problem put on seven masks okay another booster okay you know what i mean we're so meek Whereas over there, a little bit more boastful. But even there, you know, the hysteria of COVID infected them to a point where people couldn't really share their real opinions about it. So now Barry Weiss is out here talking about it. But it's just funny that she <laughs> is speaking. It's because it's hard to listen. To, it's hard to... Barry Weiss, I like her. She's got a great podcast too, but... Her views on the Israeli and Palestine conflict is just hilarious. I remember her, there's this quote, actually, yeah, there's a quote. Uh, let me just find... Uh, actually, I've got it in a tab, haven't I? Yeah, there's this quote, right? Um... <laughs> where she says that basically the the uh, the what do you call it the killing of like um kids like kids being basically you know you know remember the whole Israeli and the Israeli and Palestine conflict when it was kind of kicking off I think a couple of years ago right and uh or maybe last year was it last year or maybe a couple of years ago and she just said something like it's it's kind of like an unfortunate consequence of war that young little ba little babies and kids might die it's like what i don't know listen to god anyway let's just continue it's just funny to hear her say it in her own words uh this is a, uh, from this newsletter called uh what is it what's the newsletter called discourse blog uh barry weiss mask off by a guy called jack mirkinson and this is the following this is ba this is basically um Barry Weiss's words. The results of this mess, as always, are especially bad for Palestinians who live under Hamas rule. Casualty reports are hard to verify because Hamas controls the media, even though the international press inside the Gaza Strip. So she's already disputing the casualties, right? She's already kind of, mm, I'm not too sure that's true. Okay, cool, you got a heart. Uh, da, da, da. but it appears that more than 50 politicians have been killed some of these are people entirely innocent and non-combatants including children non-combatant children is hilarious sentence isn't it like not like it's hilarious couple of words to have next to each other right non-combatant children like what <laughs> this is an unspeakable tragedy it's also one of unavoidable burdens of political power of Zionism's dreams turn into the reality of self-determination yo 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 so yeah big up barry weiss but she's you know she's a little bit cuckoo um next on the list we're going to talk about this of course happened over the weekend ufc 270 um obviously the main event being francis Ngannou versus cyril gain cyril i've been watching him from afar from a while i've watched his debut in the ufc and i immediately thought okay this guy is, has the potential to be ufc heavyweight champion he's legitimately one of the most scariest heavyweights i've seen in that he has an ability to strike um on his feet like a middleweight like a lightweight it's just weird to see people that size you know 220 plus pounds 230 pounds whatever it is be able to kind of throw spinning wheel kicks and whatnot have that weird muay thai stance um like just it's just crazy it's just really scary and i thought okay cool if there's one person that's going to be able to maybe defeat um francis and garner and yotta go especially as a heavyweight in that regard since he's champion would be a serial game because he's just so skillful and has a little bit more precision in what he does and what we saw, I think a lot of people thought the same thing, because if I'm not mistaken, I think betting wise, he was a favorite, Cyril Gain, um, Cyril Gunn, Cyril Gain. But Francis shocked the world, man, myself included. And he's really changed my perspective on a lot of things that I kind of hold dear. One of them being this idea that people don't really change. I think only, I know that only for myself to be true, because I know how hard it has been for myself. And I would think, 
I would like to regard, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know how it is, it has been for me to change. And I would describe myself as somebody who's quite willing to change. Like I always put myself in uncomfortable positions. I always try and learn new things. I'm open to criticism. I'm self-reflective. I'm really critical, you know, to myself for the most part. I hold myself to a really high standard when I fall short of it. I beat myself up more than anybody else will beat myself, beat me up. Um, I'm very sensitive to that kind of thing. And I always want to improve in every aspect of my life, bloody blah, blah, blah. You know, the common thing. But I'm also very conscious that some people, despite wanting to change, don't. Because once we reach a certain age in life, that change just becomes more hassle than what it's worth. And sometimes the people that we surround ourselves in terms of our friends and colleagues, they might like us enough to just put up with the stuff that they don't like about us just because they like us enough and they love us so much. And that can sometimes give you the false impression that you don't need to change either. So in actuality, if you look at life and the way life's set up, unless you are down to your bare bones or you're in a position where you clearly life just keeps smacking you in the face that you need to change humans don't really do change if you give people an excuse to be shitty they will just continue to be shitty until it becomes um it, it becomes detrimental to their maybe quality of life or their career options or whatever it may be and i feel like sometimes in the ufc when it comes to fighters when they have a particular skill set it's very difficult to tell them hey go and improve this other skill set when that one skill set is what got them to where they are so Francis Ngannou has this freakish power in his fist. He's able to flip and knock people out and send them to the moon, right? With his hands, he punched a car, all this sort of crazy stuff, right? And he looks like a physical specimen, a beast in all intents and purposes. To then tell him that he needs to improve his grappling and his grappling defense and maybe improve his wrestling in general, it just seems to be an unnecessary thing because clearly he's been able to get to a really high level in the UFC doing what he's doing. And also, for the most part, you can't teach people to have knockout power. It's something you're just born with. From what I know, again, limited um, martial arts experience. I did um, Muay Thai for a couple of months in the kickboxing gym that I got a free token. No, that I bought a token for from Groupon. So my experience, I'm talking honestly from a real casual. But I know from what I've heard people say in training gyms and whatnot, that power is something that you just got given with. You can obviously train your precision. And if you believe the common, if you're kind of the Connor added just things about, you know, uh, precision is power. And if you hit somebody in the right spot, it's lights out. But that freakish ability, that kind of, um, you know, that kind of uh, Deontay Wilder, I touch you, lights out. That kind of Francis Ngannou, I touch you, lights out. That thing is just your, either you have it or you don't. And, for the most part, most people that Francis Ngannou is going to fight, if he just hits them once, it's over. So you need to have a really good chin in order to kind of survive what he's going to give you or be, you know, or be kind of avoidant or, you know, whatever it may be. But then if he's able to add wrestling to his game, he then takes a fight to another level because of how big he is and stuff. He can just dominate the fight in that regard. And if he just improves tiny bits of it and you come out of the clench and he hits you, then it's lights out. So that obviously makes him a freakishly good all around MMA um, martial artist, right? In terms of mixed martial artists, right? But he's older, right? He, he, I think he only got into the UFC, what, the last five years or so. So to expect him to train those skills and develop them over time, it's just difficult. But somehow he did. And he was so impressive against Cyril Gain that it was really scary to see how good he's been so far in the last, what, three years that he's basically improved his grappling and his wrestling. It's clear the training he's been doing the work he's been doing in the gym um the assistance he's been obviously getting from kamara uzman and these coaches it's clear to see and again it's something that was clearly they saw as a weakness and they tried to improve it and they've done it diligently because i could imagine maybe a couple of months you can maybe you know decide to do some wrestling drills then you get tired like oh fuck this i've got it down pat but he's clearly doing it in some sort of combination with his regular work to the point where he's confident enough to go for takedowns especially later on in the fight where he was losing a few rounds and in order to kind of get himself back onto some level of parity he just turned it into a wrestling match i was like oh my god he was doing sweeps and reversals and stuff, pinning Cyril Gain to the cage. There was a moment where he was trying to go for a triangle, arm bars. Like, got, like I was like, oh my God, this is so cool to see. And, and again, when you consider all the baggage around the fight, the fact that they used to be former sparring partners, the fact that France is going through this contract dispute with... Um, with what you call it with the UFC, the fact that Dana White, the chicken shit cunt, decided to leave and 
didn't wrap the belt around Cyril Gunn's waist because, you know, clearly he's got the leverage now in terms of his negotiating power. So much weight has been added on top of that thing that, you know, it, it was probably quite stressful to prepare for this fight, more so than any other fight, because there's a lot on the line. Um, because now, you know, the fight that he's talking about going to boxing and fighting Tyson Fury is more lucrative now. Him maybe going to another organisation has increased his price. Him signing on has increased his, Like, everything is up and up for him. But it's all, obviously, in order to get that leverage in sports, like in any form of sports really in the world, professional sports, you have to win. Winning gives you leverage. But of course, in the UFC, the consequences are really bleak because if you lose a couple, you're basically out, you're done. It does no coming back from it. So the fact that he was able to win against such a crazy talented fighter like a Cyril Gain, and again, in Cyril's case, it's disappointing too because the level of the UFC now is at a point where there are no gimmies unless you're fighting people outside the top 15. Everyone's lethal on their day. Everyone's dangerous. And sometimes it's even harsher at the top five because sometimes you're just unlucky that the person that's number one is just a tiny bit better than you. Five, ten percent better. But if they weren't around, you would definitely be champion. And there's few of those people in those kind of champions around, especially when Khabib was around. If Khabib, like you're seeing it now with Khabib in that division, the, bar, the belt's probably going to get passed around a lot, in my opinion, between um, the top five, because clearly they're on the same level, but Khabib was just a level above them all. Um, but yeah, that aside, great to see Cyril, I mean, sorry, great to see Francis win that way. It's, I think in that fashion, I, I think I prefer Francis to win this way because it kind of, you know, puts away my idea that you can't learn anything new when you're older. Some people don't want to learn anything. No, if you do want to learn it and you're diligent enough and you want to do the work, you can. And it's also good for him and his story that he was able to triumph over the setbacks that he's had in his career and kind of come back and defend the belt this way. Because everyone knows he can knock people out. But if you can defend the belt this way, it's obviously going to give you, it's going to give you encouragement to go back into the gym and continue your training because if you're already this good three years in at the age of 35, 36, whatever he is, imagine how he's going to be a year on, uh, two years later down the line, especially for somebody that doesn't take that much damage, right? He doesn't get hurt. He doesn't get hit too tough. He seems to have a solid chin. I can't picture him getting knocked out. I can picture him getting chokehold, sorry, getting strangled and whatnot or being compromised so he can't fight. Like imagine if he was fighting a John Jones, you know what I mean? He'd be going for that knee all the time or whatnot. But I can't imagine him getting knocked out. He doesn't have a knockout head to me. He has maybe a head that could maybe pass out from getting choked, but I can't imagine him getting knocked out. So he's in a really good position. So big up Francis Ngannou, um, UFC 270, UC 270. He smashed it. He did a ting. And now hopefully he's in a position where he can negotiate something nice for himself when it comes to the UFC. But Dana running off and not giving him and not putting a belt around him was such a pussy move. And again, goes to show how much of a piece of shit that guy is. I cannot wait until a day when he is no longer in charge of the UFC or no longer, you know, the, the, the front facing person in that regard. And they maybe go in another direction because the UFC would never get to a level that they want to get to. Somebody as unprofessional as Dana White. It doesn't exist. Somebody that has clear biases, who's clearly bitter about some people, favoritism, who has vendettas against some people. It's just that's not how you run a sporting organization, especially when it's not one person in control. Maybe split the hate. You know, there's some... Um, fucking disseminate the hate between a few people in the boardroom but don't just have it one person be the guy that's basically deciding who eats who doesn't get title shots who does get title shots who's deserving who isn't deserving but this is a shot like this this shot when he i think um cyril went for like a look exactly look at the faces in the crowd i think cyril went for like a um i think, I think cyril went for some sort of kick did he go for a kick or something and he caught him and then lifted him up and slammed him on the floor like, we've never seen this from flipping uh, Francis and Garner. Look, look at all the faces in the crowd. Look at the faces. <gasps> like, imagine people. Imagine what it sounds like hearing heavyweights punch each other. Then imagine a heavyweight that looks like Francis picking up a heavyweight that looks like Cyril and then slamming him on the floor like this. Like, God almighty. No wonder everyone's in the crowd's like, look, this guy here in the back is just like, oh, never day in paradise. Not really flinching, but everyone's so fast flinch. Look at the mouths. <laughs> You the hand here so incredible honestly man i loved it what an amazing fight man what an amazing fight next on the list here we got news courtesy of art news i went to just or artnet news sorry i went to speak about it only because it kind of wraps up a story that i've spoke about already in the podcast concerning christian rosa and forge 
Raymond Pettibon artworks or stolen artwork, right? This is a pretty crazy story about somebody, an artist who I was kind of familiar with when he first started coming up because he happened to be the kind of a toast around town in the contemporary art world circles. A couple of times I'd been to like gallery openings here in the UK. I'd heard his name mentioned a few places. People were talking about him like he was the next big thing. I didn't really get the art. I thought it was a bit, you know, a little bit meh, whatever it just looked like something that you'd maybe buy from ikea or something it didn't necessarily speak to me in any meaningful way but clearly you know he was doing great things popping up maybe this was the start of bigger and brighter things and then suddenly it went quiet i didn't really hear too tough too much about the dude and then out of nowhere this story comes out that he allegedly um was taken under the wing of raymond pettibon the legendary artist himself and somehow he betrayed the trust of raymond and decided to um nick a couple of artworks for himself and then he even decided i think to make even a couple of forgeries that he then sold on um as original works which clearly weren't and for whatever reason i don't know that's something also i'm not too sure about because clearly there was a relationship between raymond pettibon and christian rosa to the point where raymond felt comfortable enough inviting him in his home and letting him stay with him i wonder what turned him to the point where he decided to press charges because i imagine that sort of thing happens quite often with young up and coming artists. Maybe once they're taking advantage, but like taking liberties, right? Maybe they uh, use your flipping, you know, driver or your, you know, your flipping cab service too much, or they maybe take some petty cash, whatever it may be. But there's maybe a word said on behind the scenes, so you don't your reputation doesn't get damaged. Maybe they, yeah, maybe they pull you to one side. Maybe you just get blacklisted from places. But it's, it, I would imagine you never go to criminal charges and whatnot. So I wonder what else happened that would make Raymond be like, nah, we have to, we have to go to the fullest extent of the law to get this dealt with because this guy is too much. I wonder what that was the case. Maybe it was money. I don't know. Maybe something else happened that we don't really know about, but I was, I was really curious why that was the case. But anyway, this is the update courtesy of Artnet News. It says Christian Rosa, the fallen art star accused of selling forged Raymond Pettibon paintings has reportedly been arrested in Portugal. So that's where he was because I mentioned he fled the country when obviously um, the warrant was out for his arrest. No one knew where he was. Um, and I guess, you know, Portugal being the best place to be, especially if you're a uh, artist on the run and you want to drown your sorrows. Because if I'm not mistaken, you can carry up to 3.5 grams of drugs with you in your pocket. So if you want to drown your sorrows in coke, cat, meth, whatever, that's a good place to go. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. No, don't sue me. Um, Christian Rosa, the former rising artist who um, Star was inducted. So whose rising star was indicated this year on charges um, of selling fake Raymond Pettibon patents has been reportedly arrested. Rosa 43 was picked up in Portugal and is currently in the process of being extradited to the US according to Vanity Fair. Um, in October, shortly after charges were brought against him in the US attorney's office, the magazine pointed out that a picture posted on Instagram page of the artist's girlfriend, Austrian model Helen Severa, features a water bottle bearing the label Mil Fuentes, suggesting that the couple may be hiding out in Portugal. Oh my God oh my god this dumb ass b-i-t-c-h posted a picture of her drinking water in portugal and somebody was able to grab the flipping label and track the boyfriend are you insane is this her is she a thing private now of course it's private but it's too late now you absolute bird oh my god helen what are you doing, Helen? How dumb could you be? So she posted a picture of her what, enjoying a, a nice bottle of water, you know, sat in Portugal, enjoying the sun. You know, she's a pretty pale lady, so getting some rays on that pale skin must have been so refreshing and hydrating and a little bit annoying because, oh, it's kind of burning. And then, boom, somebody's able to take the bottle and, you know, zoom in on the label and see that clearly that label was from a bottle bought in Portugal. She couldn't even bought an Evian bottle. That was just non or maybe a non just taking off the label. Oh, just don't, oh, God on my man, these people, man. Like... <laughs> And again, will she be there with him when he, will she be, do you think she's going to hang around when her guy is spending countless years in prison? Or do you think she'll be chipping in if he gets fined an exorbitant amount of money or he has to pay back some damages? Do you think so? Do you really think so? That's the issue. It's one thing if she get caught, it's all well and good, right? You get caught, it is what it is. You're both living a somewhat, you know, life of crime. She must love the guy though. That must be real love. For a girl to decide to run away with a dude and also as well, what kind of pussy does a guy have to be? You go out there, right? You Again, I'm not a fan of what he did. I think it's real scumbag stuff. But if you did it, you did it. Just die on 
die on your sword. It is what it is. You try to finagle this old guy because you thought he was decrepit and didn't really know what he was doing and wasn't really sharp enough. And obviously he noticed what was going on and obviously, you know, press charges. But you try to take advantage of somebody. It didn't work out. Just kind of, you know, take the take the consequences by yourself. Don't let everybody else get involved. Don't rope people in. It kind of reminds me of the Juicy Smollett thing. Juicy Smollett was lying about that hate crime that he suffered, clearly. Um, the courts thought so. But the thing that really pissed me off was the video of him leaving the court um, leaving court when obviously the verdict was made and then you see a video of him obviously leaving with all his you know handlers around him just quickly trying to get into the car and then as the cameras are flashing um, Jussie, 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 he's obviously ignoring everybody and running away then five minutes later you see a couple of young ladies holding up an older lady who's clearly struggling to walk and they're heading out the door and then somebody was saying in the comments that was flipping Jussie's smallest mum he dragged his mother who's clearly older and suffering some sort of health complication whatever that's not allowing her to walk too tough and he put her through all of that going to the court every single day knowing that he lied that's what's the shameful part about it it's not the fact that he made up the hate crime it is what it is no one really got hurt at the back of it whatever it's annoying and it's frustrating that he did that cool but you know in the end it only hurt him really but then he has to kind of drag his whole family through the affair and have them suffer too. Same thing with this, this Christian Rosa dude. You did your scumbag stuff, just, you know, accept the punishment on your own or run away by yourself. Why are you dragging your girlfriend that happens to be a, a model, whatever, doing her thing along with you? Maybe this, maybe she's not a model anymore, but whatever. Like, it's just such a scumbag move. And her as well, posting a picture of her drinking a water bottle in the thing is just, ah, oh, epic levels of retardedness. It continues, the Vienna-based newspaper, The Standard, further reported that an Australian citizen, possibly Syrian, was also detained by Portuguese authorities. Over the paper, didn't know this guy's name. Bruv, this guy is a scumbag, bruv. He, he, he ruined his life and the life of this model. That has nothing to do with it. Or maybe she did help. I don't know. Who knows? I think this is the official... Thing just the government says man charged with selling multiple forgeries by a contemporary artist petty bond is this a new article no this is from last year okay cool but this is some of the artworks that he was charged to have kind of stolen and whatever untitled it was a moment dropping da, da, da. you've seen it right you know what it is uh buh, 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 buh. and let's continue with the article here um, the Vienna-based newspaper, The Standard, further reported that Australian citizens uh, anyway, continues here. Yeah, spokesman for the U.S. Attorney's Office declined to comment on the reports when asked about the next steps of the Rosa following extradition. The representative explained that the indictment charging the defendant is pending. So, if and when the, in, he's in the U.S. custody, he would be presented and arranged in federal court here. Rosa's scheme allegedly took place between 2017 and 2020. During that time, he's believed to have stolen four unfinished ink and watercolor works on paper from the studio of Pettibon, a friend in the former mentor then completed the artworks himself creating fake certificates of authenticity for each rosa subsequently sold the forgeries on a second-hand market yo thinking back to it yeah this is real crackhead shit in it this is somebody who's definitely have a drug addiction has to be why would you do this up and coming artists you get taken under the wing by a very well-known and prominent artist who's willing to kind of show you the way and guide you through your kind of trajectory as you're kind of ascending the rungs of artists art celebrity whatever life it may be why would you do this why would you betray their trust like this especially when they invite you into their own home it's like wow why would you do that it has to be for drugs drugs will make you rationalize the most insane things in your head trust me i've been there it makes you rationalize the dumbest situations or it makes you rationalize the most insane things in your head in general that's the only way it makes sense to do this like why would you go this far it's one thing taking finished works and selling them for a bit of, I, I don't get it i could never imagine doing stuff like this this is just a it's like going to someone's house party and stealing something from someone's house like what are you doing someone invited you to a party here you got to drink for quote unquote free, hang out, maybe hook up with somebody, have a little dance, and you're stealing. However, discerning collectors raised doubts about the legitimacy of at least one painting pointing to an uncharacteristic green tint found in the waves of the otherwise typical petty one surf scene. Ah, oh, eagle eyed. Artist next, um, so the artist text atop the paper also seemed unusually mannered, um, altered to the discrepancies. Petty Bond Studios reached out to the authorities. So the collectors that purchased the items, thinking they were real, were the ones who raised the alarm 
Pogba and then led Petty Bond to then get in contact. Maybe because he, he didn't know who it was. That's the thing. Maybe he didn't know it was um, Christian. He reported it because obviously it's a forgery. And then it was revealed through investigation that it was the Christian kid that did it. Um, it quote says he swindled buyers out of thousands of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars and risked uh, a New York artist legacy for his forgery scheme. Said the U.S. Attorney Damian Williams said in a statement upon filing the charges against Rose in October. The artist faces one count of wire fraud conspiracy, one kind of wire fraud, and one kind of aggravated identity theft. The wire fraud charges come with a maximum prison term of twenty years. Oh my God, man. Oh my God. While well, identity theft charges carry a mandatory two year sentence. Rosa's supposed actions were first publicized by Artnet in January of this year. A day after the article went live, the artist told an identified conspirator um, in an email that the secret is out. According to the documents quoted in the indictment, he fled for the country. He fled the country in February. So he's been living in February. He's been living in Portugal, what, February to when? To December. Probably thought he was going to have his first Christmas day and he got picked up. And then he decided to bring his missus along with him for the ride to do what? Like, and now she's going to have, what, charges against her or something as well. And a guy, that, a guy that would get his missus involved in something like this that he clearly did to himself is clearly not going to admit her from it too. He's definitely going to get involved. He's definitely going to fob her off or throw her under the bus or something. Maybe she was involved. Who knows? But what a sad story. What a sad way to end, man. Really, really sad way to end for both of them. But... <sighs> What can you do in it? What can you do? Let's move on from this. I want to talk about that. I should I talk about another one? I think. Uh, what should I talk about here? Let's move on. We did this. We did that. We did this. Oh, let's go here. Actually, let's talk about this. Let's speak about this. So, as you guys know, I've been covering a lot of the phenomenon known as Virgil Abloh obviously I have a um, direct relationship with the guy having worked with him a few years ago as part of this online streetwear course that I did a few years ago obviously some of you guys have seen the videos on my channel um, regarding that course that I did and you know I was able to be in and around his orbit at that time see his trajectory rise from the beginning to the top um, I'm pretty sure I actually found the original email that I used in order to apply for that job. Um, and I didn't know at the time, but they were already speaking to Virgil for to basically lead the streetwear course that I ended up um, co-producing. And I didn't know at the time I was applying for the role. And when I when I basically submitted my, um, what would you call it? When I submitted my brief of how I thought the course could go, I used Virgil as the lead curator. I used him as a, basically the lead kind of person on it to kind of teach the course because I thought his story and the way he came up was, was, was the most interesting. And I thought his ability to maybe break down the way he came up and his trajectory and the things he's learned and the little tricks and hacks and whatnot would be a great resource for the kids coming up too because they could maybe identify themselves in him because he wasn't traditionally trained and at that time a lot of people didn't really like what he did so but he still made it despite that for just pure hard work persistence and whatnot and having a bit of an eye so I thought that would be the best person to teach because it's like football they always say the, the worst coaches are always the most talented because everything to them comes as second nature so they don't think about how to control a ball they don't think about how to kick a ball they don't think about how to where to run into space it just it's all instinctive because they're really gifted and that's the, the gift the Lord gave them to play football but the best coaches are usually the mediocre ones or the ones that don't really make it to a professional level because they've had to work for everything they've had to study tape they've had to analyze how to place your foot when you want to control the ball how to receive if you want to control it with your left with your right where to position yourself if you're playing against a player that's faster than you they've really had to dissect the game in ways that a, more, a far more talented player wouldn't so Virgil I thought was the same sort of way where he could be a far better teacher for kids coming up because he's had to basically deconstruct a way of him to kind of make it in an area or in a sort of industry where people really valued uh, traditional education they valued um, knowing the history of fashion and all this sort of theory stuff but the practicality of thing wasn't really valued the actual being able to do stuff wasn't valued so um, obviously that's history I've had with the guy and unfortunately you know untimely passing happened which obviously shook um my little scene and my little industry and the world really at large because i think a lot of people really took him for granted and his influence that he had um on the scene and everything i don't think i did personally 
I think I might have been a little bit um, critical of some of the things he has done, but I never really doubted his impact and what he was basically here to do. I've always kind of argued and said that his impact was less to do with the clothes that he made and more so about him as a person. I think the fact that he was around and showed people this is possible, I kind of liken it to Pharrell when I was coming up. The fact that there was somebody like him that existed in hip hop, looking the way he did, making the music that he did, being into what he was into basically legitimized and gave people like myself a reason to also do those things and not be looked at as like a weirdo right coming up like skateboarding riding bmx wearing colorful trainers and shoes and whatnot being into japanese stuff like all this stuff was obviously it kind of legitimized further of um what um pharrell did and obviously you can see his offspring in the case of tyler the creators have basically come from that school where he basically felt comfortable in his skin by seeing somebody that looked like him also being comfortable in their skin bloody blah 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 Anyway, the from what I've read, this is the final Vir Louis Vuitton, um, Virgil Design Louis Vuitton collection that he did. Maybe I read another article that said um, he actually designed the next season. So the, what what is that? 2023 spring, summer, I suppose it might be the actual, actual last one. But I think this is the last one from what I know. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but let me know in the comments. But I'm going to play 10 minutes of it. This is men's, um, the Louis Vuitton men's fall winter 2022 show. It was actually composed and scored, I think, by uh, Tyler the Creator, if I'm not mistaken. Let's check the comments here. I'm pretty sure it was, right? The description. Yeah, music composed by Tyler the Creator. And of course, they got Benji B in there to do the old Mike D thing and then Mike Dean thing and twist the knobs here and there. I think also, but anyway, let's play the video too. Um, a great way to sort of like, um, I guess somewhat put a little bit of a punctuation mark on the Virgil Abloh um, legacy at Louis Vuitton and also his ability to basically inspire people in general. So let's see what this show had to present to us and then obviously I'll move on to some other things. Ah, oh, Bafik.
It's beautiful. So sad, man. Emotional shit. I'm not gonna lie. Emotional, emotional. So good. Wow, man. Oh, I love to see her shoes. Bit of chain mail there, nice. Oof, that suit. What a lovely colour. Come on. This fits so well. This is so beautiful. What a beautiful, beautiful show. Wow. Oh. The outfit that Alton's got on. Wow. This is so good, man. So good. The chains, yeah, that look is amazing. Wow, man. (sighs) 
Look at that. That's such a Virgil look. It looks incredible, man. So well done. Don T collaboration on the hat too. Oof, look at that hoodie. Anyway, I'll leave it for now here. I won't carry on too long. And then we'll continue the rest of the show. But yeah, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful way to honour such a great man. Honestly. Wow, so emotional. I can only imagine what that must have been like being there. I can only imagine how emotional that must have been there. Especially for his friends and family and shit. And the team he worked with at the time. God, what a bittersweet moment, isn't it? Because clearly, you know, this was his dream. You know what I mean? Especially if you're really about this fashion life, you're really about clothes, having the ability to basically imbue your aesthetic at a luxury house like Louis Vuitton, given his background, given where he's from, given what he represents, must have been such an amazing job to have. And maybe that was, you know, a great way to kind of close the chapter on his life in some weird way even though such an unfortunate passing and you know no no one no one you know should be dying at that sort of age you know just there's so much more to give but at least he had the ability whilst the short time he was around on this earth he was able to really 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 achieve his dreams and live his dreams you know what i mean he, he basically got to spend 10 years into or well, basically 10 years working with one of the most influential people in the world in Kanye West and then he took that and essentially built an entire career and universe around it and he ended up then going and inspiring his own set of people too it wasn't like he was just working under Kanye's shadow he took what Kanye had learned had basically you know done and what he learned from him the good and the bad and applied it in his own journey and then that's also going to then inspire a whole group of people who are coming up too so his influence is tenfold hundredfold a thousandfold a millionfold whatever it is it's 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 really there to to be seen and maybe now with a bit of distance and the fact that he's not here anymore and the fact that you know his influence is going to be felt for generations to come that people will maybe be a little bit more forgiving to the work and basically be able to see it through his lens a bit more um i still think his best work was what he was early on especially i think his best work was definitely um the off-white women's i thought that was some of his strongest stuff i thought the early off-white men's was really great then it got into a bit of a low period maybe he was a bit uninspired but then he then definitely in my opinion came to his um he definitely started flexing his muscles a bit more when he started working with louis vuitton because clearly he had all the resources to do whatever he wanted anything in his head he could imagine could basically be put into reality and he really took that and kind of ran with it to a way in a way that you can't really deny you know some of these suits and the proportions and the cuts are really good especially since he brought ib kamara on to help him out with the styling and maybe the refinement you can definitely see an improvement in the last few years in terms of the level that his clothes has gone to but the vision the taste level the perspective um the influence of the inspiration the references they're all just so multi-layered it's probably too deep to even get into do you know what i mean especially on my show anyway i don't really have the 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 platform that it could give that kind of um work and research that deserve the credit that it deserves but even his purple the purple the plum whatever that tone is and hue that he uses just amazing so striking look how rich this looks without looking always cartoony the length of the trousers the little heel on the back of these boots like oof. it's all really good but of course the piece de resistance i thought was the look that alton mason had on this is quintessential virgil this basically looks like something virgil would wear day to day such an incredibly good fit from the shoes to the cut of the pants to the cut of the varsity jacket that's something that some people don't give him credit enough to virgil made a hell of a varsity jacket he was really the varsity jacket king and he didn't do those team ones too because i hate the team ones I already spoken about on it on the podcast how i think the team ones are 
basically a form of clickiness and you know um separate you know they kind of separate the core and the not core especially in streetwear and i think streetwear has always been inclusive anybody can take part as long as they're interested but those team jackets that they don't give to certain people you get this color you get that color it's just like come on man we're all adults here what is this whereas i think virgil just made cool that jacket for everybody if you had the money you could pay for it you got a cool jacket um i thought they were done really really well um they look amazing you know what i mean really, really one of the most underrated pieces in a virtual um design louis vuitton collection in my opinion but yeah big up everybody that walked the show um the music was incredible tyler the creator scored the hell out of that oh look he got his own variations i guess of the bottega veneta or lug boot everyone basically did it so you can't really get too hype on it um you can't really hate too much on it i also like the bag got little climbing um little climbing frame little climb what they call climbing frame. when you only people what the, what the, what's it called when people go do that thing is it free climbing whatever it is it's really popular these days or a fix on the side of it the card the show below everything looks all right everything looks amazing let's not really kid ourselves here everything looks really 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 well done this fluffy fleece looks amazing too i love the look of that fleece hoodie look, oh so lush but yeah man r.i.p to the great man memory will live on as always as i mentioned like similar architectural you know architects which he is you know um, classically trained in that regard um his work will live on and that will be a good way people to remember him by um, i'm sure as time goes on people will be pulling out references from stuff that they probably didn't notice in the past and that will be you know dissected and gone on and i guess his career also will also be dissected in that way people will use it as a blueprint in order to kind of um, guide themselves in their own journey oh, look at that look at the cut of this suit this whole ensemble is just brilliant isn't it this is look 38 i'm checking out in case you're listening via the audio version of the podcast oh, just incredible 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 stuff from him man. really great way to sort of end it if it is ended like i said i'm not too sure i remember reading something that this was the last one because supposedly it was 90 95 percent done before he unfortunately passed away but maybe there might be some other stuff left that they're going to show on the other runway going forward and then i guess from then on they'll probably then probably announce who's going to take over but yeah look how beautiful this is man there's something so gracious about this entire fit you know but yeah emotional to say the least man i can only imagine how his friends must feel it must feel so bittersweet because they're so used to seeing the great man gallivanting and walking down the runway at the end hugging people and stuff getting them involved and that's something also i loved about him that he did about the fashion shows he really made them i wouldn't say an event but he made them he made them seem normal by just acting normal you know the fingers up running down with somebody hugging someone in a crowd fist bumping somebody it wasn't so like tense you know what i mean he made it so relaxed and yeah man inclusive and just you know a great place to be for people so you can only give look at this there's so much symbolism you can attach to these um looks with the angel wings attached to them right uh, ascending upwards maybe he knew his own mortality at that time naomi campbell the legend walking down the runway too with a snapback tie on you can only stand you can only stand such a shame in it such a crying shame but you know at least people would then see what he did and be able to emulate and try and use whatever experience and lessons that he left in terms of guiding them on their own little journey and like i said before for me it's just kind of really drums home the idea of just putting stuff out not being too precious about things and be willing to embarrass yourself in public be willing to fail be willing to um yeah be willing to fail basically fall flat on your face make mistakes in public that's something you have to really give virgil and kanye credit for they do that constantly kanye's first collection in paris the one he basically funded out of his own pocket and put himself on the fashion week calendar because he just wanted to take part and he loved fashion so much i remember somebody saying in a review maybe it was kathy horn or something saying just because you love fashion doesn't mean you should make it like some snarky quote i was like oof right and from what he said in an interview recently with jason lee which just came out he said something like oh christina um, centera one of the stylists who um i'm a big fan of who does her own collection too she's got this sort of like wardrobe staple thing that she does where you basically buy a, an entire pack of clothes each season which has got like a hoodie an overcoat a, a tracksuit pants whatever she does something really cool in that regard but she's also a stylist in her regard and she'd worked with virgil you know when he started off white i think she was still there um before his passing and maybe she took a bit more of a prominent role when he started to do more of the louis vuitton stuff i'm not really too sure but she said to kanye something along 
along the lines of, oh, um, they're going to laugh at you when you put this down the runway because it's so bad, isn't it? And at the time, people didn't like it. But now looking back at it, it wasn't as bad as people made it seem. And so what? It was his first try. And since then, he's basically been hitting them at the park since then in terms of Kanye. And that's something you have to give people credit for, those guys, because most people wouldn't do that. Most people wouldn't put on a show. It's like putting on an art gallery show. For yeah, a show for your art in a gallery somewhere, inviting loads of people and no one turns up, or they do turn up and they write horrible reviews about the stuff that you do and they say that you shouldn't be drawing just because you can draw, you shouldn't be making art, some sort of thing. How hurtful that would be. But those guys, regardless of the odds, regardless of the pushback, regardless of the negativity, regardless of the criticism, sometimes when people that are nearest and dearest to them, because like I mentioned before in other podcasts, as great as Virgil was in terms of an inspiration, it was also quite annoying to see some of his friends who are really close to him and around him the whole entire time you know having a lot to say about him and begging him up when when it's convenient but then they wouldn't wear any his clothes none of these guys were going out and buying louis vuitton design you know virgil design louis vuitton pieces for themselves they were just waiting to get you know um to get gifted or what or they just or they just didn't buy it i didn't see a lot of his friends wearing off-white for instance like as actual clothes to wear themselves they were just out there kind of you know pretending they kind of didn't see the collection or they didn't have an opinion on it but you know but then yet yeah, getting angry when people don't that didn't know him had a lot of things to say about his work because that's something that's the only thing they could talk about just his work so that was always annoying but again man you gotta give those guys credit you know what I mean they uh they uh they put it all out on front street they weren't willing to work in secret in a studio somewhere everything got shipped like the, it's that kind of um apple mindset there is no such thing as concepts there is no such thing as renders and stuff left on psd files no 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 we make we produce we ship we manufacture we ship we ship we ship we ship we get that shit out there into people's hands and let them touch and feel it and whatever response we get from people is what we get but at least we're playing we're in the game we're not on the bench on the side looking from the outside in waiting to get invited no 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 i'm taking part and that's something I've really taken away from Virgil and my my kind of short, short time I had with him, very brief time. That's what I basically took from it. Is that, okay, this guy really believes his shit. He's really backing it. He's putting away his money, his money where his mouth is and he's just showing up and doing it. I remember that was a kind of quote I remember reading of from Hiroshi Fujiwara when people were basically, I think he was responding to people basically saying he does the same thing again and again or something. And he was like, oh, people are just upset that I actually do the thing that's in my head and I try it out and I do it. They always say they could do it, but I did it first. I think it's something like that. Like they say that he could do it, but no, I'm the one that did it. And he rushed for dry from the mistake, and he was a person that invented the the kind of the little label that people put on the side of their um, shirts, on the sleeve or on the bottom of the hem, a sort of like logo thing, right? A kind of badge of honor, a sort of way to sort of give people a, a heads up of like, yeah, you know what's up. So he was saying, yeah, no, I actually do it. I don't talk about it. I do the thing. So big up Virgil for doing the thing. Big up him for inspiring people. Um, R.I.P. to a legend. Long live Virgil. Virgil forever. Um, his influence is going to be felt for generations to come, I think. Somebody basically proved the thesis that you can come from streetwear. You can screen print things. Iron on. Design flyers. Make, you know, mix tapes and whatnot. And, you know, DJ mixes. And you can ascend to the loftiest of loftiest positions working for one of the biggest luxury house fashion houses out there with all the resources having new guys group back you and your own brand let lvhm endorsements from just that kind of humble beginnings right in terms of fashion experience and design experience and be able to go to the highest of the highs he did it he really did so yeah that's the excellent thing show i think episode number two four five i'm going to leave it there for now i don't want to chew too much off you because i think i've been speaking already for too long um, if you enjoyed the show, hope you enjoyed the show anyway. Hope you did. If you did enjoy the show, especially if you're watching through YouTube, please leave me a little um, thumbs up. Maybe if you want to come back, subscribe. If you listen via the podcast app, maybe a little review if you can. That'll be appreciated. If you're not, then I do appreciate your time regardless. Thank you for stopping by and listening to me ramble for a few hours or for an hour and a bit. And um, hopefully I'll see you again very soon. Of course, there's a Patreon episode out already. If you're on a Patreon, you should have got sorry the alert for it it's episode 14 so definitely check it out if you haven't already and if you want to be subscribed to the patreon to get a bonus episode and definitely check the link in the description you'll find all the information you need to subscribe and whatnot it's only a pound equivalent of one dollar to get subscribed on there that's a first tier and of course it goes up but basically you get one bonus episode per week available only for my patreon subscribers so if you want that bonus episode that's not going to be available anywhere else only on patreon then click the, the link in the description and that will take you straight to it and you can do as you 
wish. But again, thanks again for tuning in. If you listen via the audio version of the podcast, you hear a song. And if you're watching via YouTube, you won't hear anything. It will just end right here. But thanks again for tuning in.